Joining the program now is David Harsani. David is a nationally syndicated columnist and a senior editor at The Federalist. If you're not familiar with The Federalist, it's a conservative-leaning website that was first launched back in September 2013. He is the former editor of Human Events and opinion columnist at The Denver Post. And prior to that, he was actually a sports journalist. He wrote for the AP, the New York Daily News, Sports Illustrated Online. Uh, So he's moved his way from sports uh, to politics and now author his latest book, The People Have Spoken and They Are Wrong, came out uh, March 10th. uh, So just a few days ago. David, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Yes, the people have spoken and they are wrong because they usually are. You know, I think what was it was it who the, the guy who said was it uh, uh, um, uh, Samuel Cle- Clemens who said that when I find myself on the side of the majority that it's time to reform. Um, but yet yeah, normally uh, the majority is wrong, which is why the framers of the Constitution did not want to create a democracy. In fact, had they created a democracy, they would have been laughed out of, uh, out of you know out of uh, Philadelphia. Because nobody really of any intelligence uh, back then, uh, you know, uh, you know, considered democracy a, a viable form of government, uh, right? They, they 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 had studied the failed democracies going all the way back to Greece. Uh, they knew that they didn't work. Uh, they called it mobocracy. Uh, so the last thing that the founding fathers wanted for the republic that they were creating was for it to succumb to the evils of democracy. Right. I mean, I think that's exactly right, except that I don't think they went far enough in condemning what democracy is about. You know, I mean, I guess I have three problems with it. One is philosophically the idea, like you mentioned before, that if a bunch of people think something's okay or moral or works right, that it does. Secondly, I have a problem with the majority coercing the minority, which happens a lot in this country now. And thirdly, the structural Structural democracy is just a bad way to govern. It creates all kinds of problems, not just for the minority, but for us moving forward, because we believe a lot of things right now, and we may vote for them, but tomorrow we may change our minds, yet we have to live with the consequences of those choices uh, in a democracy all the time. Yeah, I mean, most people, though, they just think, well, if the majority wants to do it, well, then it's good because the majority voted for it. But, you know, if the majority want to steal the money from the minority, uh, then that doesn't make it right. And the minority shouldn't just say, well, I guess, you know, we, we voted for it. Uh, so I have to support it. You know, I mean, that's what's the, the definition of a democracy was uh, is, is two is two wolves and a sheep voting on what to have for dinner. You know, right. and, 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 and a republic is a well-armed sheep uh, challenging the vote. <laughs> that's right, and that's why we diffuse the vote so we can have and live in communities we want to live. You know, I lived in Colorado for a long time. There was Boulder, very liberal, you know, and uh, Colorado Springs is very conservative, and people can choose to live with people that, you know, that, that want to have communities that reflect their own values. That's all democracy is. It's just a process uh, that reflects our ethics and morals and so forth. Yeah, but how did democracy, you know, become the be-all and end-all? I mean, now everybody just equates freedom and prosperity and America with democracy and all the ideas of the framers that, you know, democracy has to be checked, uh, that it's, it, it, it's not synonymous with freedom and liberty, uh, you know, that they don't go hand in hand, that in many cases they're mutually exclusive. You know, how did we become so enamored uh, with democracy despite, you know, the, 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 our founding documents? So you read the Constitution, the word democracy is not there. It's not in the Declaration of Independence. Uh, the, the only thing is that's in the Constitution is that the Congress shall guarantee to all the states a republican form of government that's it right well one one thing that for sure has happened is that politicians love the idea of democracy because they can scaremonger you uh they can use emotion and populism to get you to vote for them and then they can you know they have power over people so i think that Mm -hmm. we've learned in schools that are run by government and so forth that Mm -hmm. democracy is a great idea also i just think people confuse democracy and freedom all the time as a shorthand of sorts Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and they think, you know, I think I mentioned on the show, well, maybe I didn't, but, you know, just, you know, look, look, at, look at the situation in South Africa. Remember, you know, all the protests about apartheid, uh, and not that I'm, you know, just going to d- defend apartheid, but, you know, if you look at the situation in South Africa today, particularly for black South Africans, they are worse off in any, in any way you want to look at it. The crime statistics, I mean, South Africa is the rape capital of the world now, but poverty is growing, uh, income inequality is growing, crime, everything. I mean, the country is a disaster with democracy. You know, when it's one man, one vote, they are worse off. Even even black South Africans, when you poll them, they'll say, well, we were better off under apartheid. But all the people that were protesting apartheid, they don't they don't they don't care at all about what's happening in South Africa now. You know, now that there's democracy, the fact that there's misery uh, and that people are leaving South Africa, people are trying to get out. Back before, you know, when there was apartheid, people were trying to get in. Blacks from all over sub-Saharan Africa were trying to get in to South Africa. Now the blacks that are there want to leave. Well, because I think the blacks there and other people who helped them confused uh, having a vote and having freedom. It's not the same thing. You know, that's why we worry about individual freedom here. There's a lot, there are a lot of things more important than a vote. And more people to vote, the less your vote means anything, right? I mean, the, you know, the larger the pool is and the more it, everything sort of is messed up. But I have a whole chapter in my book about economic economics and, and populism and how, uh, how democracy really hurts us because people believe lots of stupid ideas. And I'm not that familiar with South Africa, but I, I suspect that's the case. Yeah, well, of course. I mean, look, people talk about how important it is to vote. You know, like I'm going to be moving to Puerto Rico at some point, And when I get down there, I can't vote anymore. And it's like, well, big deal. I mean, I won't pay taxes. I mean, that, that, you know, every, almost everybody I've ever voted for has lost. So what good has voting done me? And Nothing. I always vote for, for the loser. Just- yeah, and everyone you voted for probably disappointed you as well, right? It's like well, yeah. even yet, yeah, even when I held my nose and voted for the lesser of two evils, right? I did vote for Ronald Reagan. Uh, I think that's the last president I voted for who won, uh, because I, you know, I never voted uh, for either of the Bushes. I voted Libertarian. I didn't vote, you know, I didn't vote for Clinton. Uh, you know, so as far as the presidential election, the last time I voted for the winner was Reagan. And, yes, he did disappoint me. Um, but, you know, locally, I, I, I might have voted in a local election that where I might have voted for the winner. But almost all the time I vote for the loser. Uh, so my vote, my vote is canceled out by some idiot. You know, so and I've told people I would rather live in a country where I couldn't vote, but where, where there was good government. Maybe there was some criteria for voting that I didn't meet. Right. But I was confident that the people who could vote were going to vote for good government. I would right. rather have that than live in a country where I knew I could vote, but my vote was going to be canceled out by some moron who was voting for socialism. Well, and your vote is canceled out here because there are a lot of idiots <laughs> who vote. You see in polling. I'm not just talking about socialism and a disagreement on economic policy, but just basic knowledge about how government works, what, what people are voting on. I think it's like 40 percent of people don't know the difference between Medicaid and Medicare, but yet they have a say in what my health care looks like. That's, that's a dangerous precedent to set in a country, I think. Yeah, and the whole idea that, you know, voter turnout. I mean, everybody wants more voter turnout. The more, the better. I say no. I mean, why do we want people who don't know anything voting anyway? I mean, just going in there and going eeny, meeny, miny, mo. I mean, but the politicians act as if we just want everybody to vote, regardless of the outcome, regardless of what they're voting for. You know, they can be functionally illiterate and just, you know, you know, just, you know, you know, pushing, you know, just randomly just putting their finger on some on a, on a candidate. And apparently that's better than them staying home. Look, I want the uninformed voters who don't understand not to vote. You know, the, I'm concerned about the outcome, not the process. We'll talk more about that. we got a break. We will be right back. The Peter Schiff Show. Nine out of ten historians agree. If Thomas Jefferson and Thomas Paine were alive today, both would be Schiff Radio Premium members. Somewhere up there, Thomas Jefferson is looking down with great pride. Schiff Radio continues right now. We're talking to David Harsani about his newest book, The People Have Spoken and They Are Wrong, which deals with the 
uh, subject of uh, democracy, which, of course, you know, the politically correct thing to do is to be very pro-democracy, uh, to come out as being against democracy. It's like un-American. It's like coming out against apple pie or baseball. I mean, you have to be some kind of a communist, right, not to be in favor of democracy. Uh, so, David, tell me, you know, how did you broach this subject in your book? What are some of the facts that you use to kind of pierce this myth uh, that everybody believes about the, the benevolence of democracy? Well, the first half is about the voters themselves, because that's what democracy is, how educated we are or uneducated we are. But even if we wanted to be educated, how tough it would be when government's gotten so big and so centralized in Washington for us to understand all that's going on. It's almost impossible. Uh, and then I go into a little bit of the philosophical history of it. And then I also talk about real-life examples around the world where democracy is a disaster in the Gaza mm -hmm. Strip. In Russia, in Egypt, in, in other places where we see uh, religious fanatics or, or people who have different views of the world and don't believe in liberty uh, voting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if you live, if you're surrounded by a bunch of idiots, obviously you don't want democracy. I mean, you know, you know, uh, especially if you're going to have to live, uh, you know, by you know what by what they do. I mean, you know, just like you know, in you know, a school, you know, a, a you know, a kindergarten isn't a democracy. The teacher doesn't ask the kids, okay, what should we do next? Let's vote on it. You know, because theoretically, the teacher is supposed to know a lot more than the six-year-olds, and they're not supposed to put everything up to a vote. Right, and, and, and especially in the United States where you're federalism, if you have Washington so powerful and so centralized that they can make every community participate in something like Obamacare, coerce you to do it, you have no more choices. You can't even pick up and move somewhere else to uh, live in the sort of community you want. You're, you're stuck. And that's what I think we've seen more and more because, and you, I know this is probably a good topic for you, but you know, you have a federal government that can print money. They never really have any debt to worry about, but states cannot do that, so they can be bribed to participate in all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the whole stigma, the whole idea that, oh, but the people, the people have to decide, you know, I think it's kind of, uh, you know, very ironic that, you know, the people that are big supporters of democracy, uh, let's say the left, they think the people have to vote on everything. Yet they think people are so stupid that they can't decide what foods to eat, you know, what schools to go to, that the government needs to protect everybody from their own incompetence because nobody can be trusted to make personal decisions over their own lives. Yet we need to trust them with the vote and deciding who's going to lead the country, but they can't decide, you know, you know, you know, you know whether they should uh, have uh, milk uh, that's, that's uh, homogenized past whatever it is. I mean, we can't make the tiny little decisions for ourselves, but we're supposed to make all these big decisions and get it right. Right. Even in Washington now, you know, they decide what my kid has at lunchtime for, you know, for, for, for food and lunch. But, you know, it's funny that you mention that because... Even when they're engaged in some sort of authoritarian thing like signing a bunch of executive orders, the excuse is always, well, most people agree with us so that we have to, you know, we have to get around the process that takes too long and moves too slow and allows people to mm -hmm. create gridlock and hold up progress, you know, which is a key word for, for democracy, and then, you know, just sign an executive order. So even when they're authoritarian, they're using democratic arguments to get it done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, the whole idea behind the way we have a system is to slow things down. That's exactly yeah. what the framers wanted to do, because they knew that we were starting with complete liberty and that, you know, any time that there was a new law, it would be an encroachment on that liberty. And, and so they wanted to make sure that it happened very slowly. Uh, so, A, that it might not happen at all. But B, if something does happen that, you know, it's fully vetted, it takes a lot of time, it's not just a fad, it's just not something that the wind is blowing and it's popular opinion. Uh, but now you have, you know, the, the, the president clearly just wants to circumvent those safeguards so that they don't work and so that we end up uh, doing the bad things that the framers tried to save us from. Right. I mean, everyone complains about gridlock in Washington, which I think has been awesome. And, you know, the House has inadvertently been awesome as well because they have stopped, you know, a sort of a, a tra you know, a train wreck from happening, I think. Well, maybe not. But, uh, you know, one time you have the left rise, they pass a lot of bills. Organically, then the right, there should be a reaction in this country, and they slow everything down. It works just as it's supposed to, I think, or I hope this is what the founders envisioned. Now, we slow down, and we're going to have to find a happy medium somewhere at some point or, or not. But you can't have one party yeah. dictating to the other half of the country how to live all the time. Well, the scary part is look at how much damage they've done 
you know, with the slow down process. Imagine how much worse it would be if they can do it even quicker, if they can get all these bad laws passed. I mean, like President Obama is talking about raising minimum wage to 10, 10 an hour. I mean, maybe he'll eventually succeed, uh, but it's going to take years and years uh, to get it through. If he could have just done it by decree, then the damage would be that much quicker. Yeah, if you had one party running Washington right now, all of those uh, populist economic policies, which a lot of economists don't like, would just be rolling right through because people like them. Voters like the sound of it mm-hmm. because they haven't thought them through. And uh, that's, that's dangerous. That's why we have a House and a Senate and all, you know, and, 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 and all kinds of uh, competing – uh, institutions in Washington. At least they should be competing. And then also, of course, there's yeah. the courts, which are supposed to stop democracy, but they don't do it either. Well, that's why, you know, we're supposed to be, if there's, it's a representative democracy to the extent you want to call it a democracy, where the people vote for representatives who are then supposed to use their better judgment to vote for laws. They're not supposed to rubber stamp what their constituents want to do. That's why I don't, you know, whenever you see these politicians saying, well, I'm going to listen to my voters and my constituents and I'm going to do what they want. No, that's not why they're there. They're not there to do what the people want. They're there to do what they think is right, even if their constituents don't understand that it's wrong. A good leader should be trying to convince them about, you know, this policy isn't going to work or this is going to work. You should think about this. But that's no longer the case. Now you just have uh, career politicians and all they care about is being elected. So they're never going to risk doing something that undermines their popularity. Yeah, which undermines the whole system of having representatives. Why don't we just get rid of the representatives and just have the direct democracy where the people just vote directly for the laws? I mean, if they're if they're if their elected representatives are just going to do a poll and vote exactly what the electorate wants, because that's how they get reelected, then there's no reason to have them there. And, and that's why the founders never envisioned career politicians of this nature either. They thought that, you know, you'd have a farmer or a businessman who'd go to Washington for a few years, represent his community, and come back home. But obviously you don't get that. Now you have generational uh, representatives and presidents and so forth. It's dynastic almost. So, uh, it, and, and the incumbents almost always win. I mean, I think I forgot what the number was, but it was higher than ever. People hate Washington, but they love their own representatives because they do whatever they yeah. want to. And if you remember, or people remember, but senators were never held to election. They were always appointed by state legislatures. And even the president and the vice president initially, they were elected by the Electoral College, which were representatives of the people who were there to vote who they thought would be the best president. Not, you know, it wasn't a, a, a popular election. But of course, you know, as time went by, all of these safeguards gradually eroded away. And we became the creature that the founding fathers feared. Right. The senators were, were sent by legislators so that they would be better represent their state, not become sort of national figures like they are now and not really worry very much about their states at all. It was just another level of diffusing democracy. I think that that was very helpful. Um, but if you if you mention that or the Tenth Amendment or anything else, you'll just be branded a racist and, you know, uh, a person standing athwart progress. So yeah. uh, it's, yeah. it's very difficult. Well- David, well, hey, thanks for coming on the show. Good luck again. Uh, good luck with your book. Again, the name of the book is "The People Have Spoken," and they are war- they are wrong, taking on the challenging, sacrosanct subject of democracy. And more people need to speak out against it. It's dangerous politics, uh, but people have to realize that uh, you know what this country used to be and what it stood for. Thanks a lot. Our oh, we got another half hour coming up.